the Australian Financial Review. Hello, I'm James Thompson, Senior Chanticleer Columnist at the AFR. Welcome to our weekly news breakdown of all things business, finance and markets. With me today, as always, is my Chanticleer colleague, the man who's definitely going to have a better weekend than Donald Trump. It's Anthony McDonald. How are you, Anthony? God, I swear I'm innocent, James. Fantastic. Well, this week we ask whether AI really will claim the jobs of 30% of executives in two years. We ask what Lend-Lease's big breakup says about corporate Australia, and we examine how to give your investment portfolio a touch of richless magic. Let's start with a bit of breaking news, though. And no, it's not Donald Trump's conviction in New York. It's that GYG, or Guzmani Gomez, the burrito-making chain, is trying to reopen the IPO market. It's lodged a prospectus for a $240 million IPO, which will value the company at $2.2 billion. Anthony, what's the pitch? And do you think this float will get the IPO market moving again? Maybe. I mean, there's a bit of excitement around it. They've very, they've structured this deal quite smartly. They've structured it for a tough IPO market. They've really, they've snuck the IPO out without broadcasting it too widely. Yeah. It sounds like they, they just went out to a small group of investors and made sure they could get that 240 million bucks before launching it. So it's definitely going to happen. It's underwritten. It's coming. I mean, the pitch is all about GYG's potential growth in Australia. I think there's about 200 odd stores. They reckon that McDonald's has a thousand. It's the benchmark. You know, so over time, it can move closer to a 1,000. I mean, as an outsider, you've got to say, all right, well, can you actually get the properties? Because, you know, fast food's as much about the property as it is the food itself. Yep. GYG says, you know, it's got a strong, big pipeline of, of uh, drive throughs and in particular, that it's been working on for the past couple of years. So it does have that pipeline of properties. So, hey, who knows? They're, I guarantee you, whatever happens, there's going to be plenty of headlines around it, plenty of excitement. People will be talking about it. Yes. There's just something about this little GYG that makes it quite captivating. It's it's a, a really unlikely business to reopen the float window, though. I mean, 12 months ago, the co-founder and CEO announces he's going to retire and then unannounces he's going to retire. Nine months ago, they put in a co-CEO from uh, TDM Partners, which is a private equity firm that's GYG's biggest shareholder. Seven months ago, they settled this really acrimonious legal case in America. And then here we are. We're about to have one of the, the bigger floats of the year from the same company. So it's really fascinating. But to your point, it's all about the growth. It's pitched as a growth story. It's growing really strongly now. And who says they can't keep it going? Uh, uh, that's the question that investors will be mulling over in the next few weeks. But Anthony, a deal of a different kind fell apart this weekend, mm-hmm. and that's the $75 billion takeover battle between BHP and the London-listed miner Anglo-American. Uh, Anglo rejected BHP's calls for an extension to their talks, and BHP's walked away, as it is required to do under British takeover laws. So what I can't figure out, Anthony, who's the winner and who's the loser here? Oh, the winner's got to be Anglo-American shareholders. I mean, BHP turned up, what, six weeks ago? And they forced Anglo to get real on its own sort of issues and its strategy. And so BHP just turning up, that's that's got Anglo to look internally, come up with some plans. Four weeks later, announces this firm plan to just share prices up. There's new metrics in front of the shareholders. There's this new vision. And it's now up to management to execute it. Now, whether it's executed or not, at least shareholders have that plan in front of them. They've got something that they can hold management's feet to the fire over the coming 12 months. So for me, that's that's a win for Anglo-American shareholders. And if things don't go well, there's always BHP in the background, right? If, uh, yeah. you know, they'll know that B- they know that BHP likes the copper assets, if nothing else. So if, if I mean, if Anglo-American's the winner, then the only other party involved, BHP, they've They've got to be the loser for now, right? I mean, they outed themselves as a big buyer, but what has it lost? I mean, nothing really. We, we know that it's a big buyer of something. That's going to hang over its head for a while. You know, anytime BHP talks now in the coming 12 months, people are going to be like, well, where's your big deal? How's your big deal going? You know, where, what, what are you thinking about next? Anglo, you'd think, still target number one. You know, like I said, management has to get that right. What about you, James? Who do you think's the winner and the loser? 
I'm going against you here. The oh. loser is the loser is Anglo shareholders. They had the chance oh. to merge with the best mining company in the world, and they've decided to go down their own plan. I think the 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 plan was hastily concocted. It's only a few months since investors were so frustrated with this company after it reduced capacity in order to save costs. The shares were in the toilet. Yes, okay, they've come up with a breakup plan, but there's no guarantee it'll work. And now they've got to bear all that risk of it working. So I think Anglo shareholders have missed the boat here. I think BHP's a winner. They haven't overpaid. They haven't taken too much risk. And now they can sit back and see if Anglo can actually pull this plan off. And if they can't, if Anglo can't, then BHP can swoop in on on various assets. First thing that Anglo is going to sell is the Queensland coal mines it owns, mm-hmm. which sit right next to door to BHPs. Yep. So there you go, BHP. Just buy those. Don't go through the heartburn of a big takeover. Buy those coal assets that you want. See how the Anglo plan goes, and maybe you can pick off the the copper assets down the track. So I don't know. I think I, I think we're seeing this one differently, and maybe that says nobody's a winner and nobody's a loser. Perhaps. No, I think it just means you can. Look at it either way. Yeah. James, you're a former Rich List editor, so imagine you're like a kid on Christmas Day uh, today with the 41st edition of the list out. Gina Reinhardt is number one for the fifth year in a row, and it's pretty hard for the average investor to replicate her massive iron ore empire. But James, you found a way to jump in on the coattails of our wealthiest entrepreneurs. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, I've got a. I've done a little experiment here, Anthony. Mm-hmm. What I've done is I've hypothetically invested a thousand bucks in the 37 companies that are associated with rich listers. So that's everything from Atlassian over in the US to Fortescue, Wise Tech, Seven Group, Aristocrat, Goodman, oh, yeah. News Corp, Prometicus, Pact Group, Super Retail Group. There's the list goes on. So mm-hmm. what I've done, I've invested a thousand bucks in each of them Mm -hmm. at four various points, Mm -hmm. one year ago, three years ago, five years ago, and 10 years ago. And I've seen how that would perform against the market. So if you put a thousand bucks into the companies 10 years ago, they would have delivered you a return of 832%. Mm -hmm. Now that compares to the ASX 200 equal weight index foot, which delivered 47%. And the S&P 500 delivered a much better 115%. So you're still well ahead with the rich listers. If you go three years, your rich lister portfolio would have delivered you 35.4%. The ASX 200 actually went backwards during that time. Yeah, right. And the S&P 500 was only up 7.6%. So, I mean, this isn't rocket science, okay? There's lots of people out there who say, if you want an easy sort of way to invest, just back founders, back owner operators because they think long-term, they're emotionally invested in their business and they deliver great returns. And that's exactly what you you see from these numbers. Even if you invested a thousand bucks one year ago, the rich lister portfolio would have delivered you 15.7% return, whereas the ASX 200 did 3.9% and the S&P 500 did 15.5%. So you're still marginally ahead with those rich listers even, even over one year. That's some huge wins there. Yeah, and, and you, I mean, some of the companies uh, are pretty spectacular. ProMedicus, yeah. uh, which we know is a medical imaging company, it did 96% in the last 12 months. You look at a company called Mada Group, which I hadn't really heard of until mm. this week. They're a, a contracting business that does maintenance for mines. Mm. Um, they've delivered uh, 628% return in the last three years. Far out. That's very impressive, isn't it? And some of the returns when you look out 10 years are even more in, you know, more impressive companies like La Visa, the the jewelry chain that Brett Blundy owns. It's done over a thousand percent return in that 10 years. So, so these rich listers really know what they're doing. And that list of companies really gives you a way to sort of go along for the ride with them, which is really interesting. Well, Anthony, let's move to our first topic. And the Financial Review held its inaugural AI Summit in Sydney on Tuesday. And it's fair to say it was a seriously big event. A sold out room at the Fullerton Hotel, panels on everything from AI regulation to investing in AI to the country's hottest AI startups and how AI is actually being used by big corporates. I'm biased, of course, but I reckon my panel, which was called the AI Big Picture, provided the line of the day from Adam Drusi, the CEO of the big data consultancy, Quantium. 
Let's listen to his big call. I think uh, AI is going to change everyone's jobs, pretty much every job anyway. When I think about that and the people in this room, I, I kind of look at executive teams and I think probably in two years' time, 30% of the people around this table won't be sitting here anymore. And that'll be the 30% that don't embrace AI and don't think about how they change their jobs and how they lead their organisations to embrace AI. Anthony, it's a seriously big call, and Adam was happy to come back in two years and see if he was right. Could he be correct, though? Huge call. I think he might be getting a bit excited, James. 30% in two (laughs) years. I mean, I know he's talking to a room full of knowledge workers. You know, these conferences, they're normally full of big crowds of consultants and office workers and you know, and a lot of their jobs are probably up for grabs from AI, but two years, yeah. that's very soon. I mean, if you think about the big changes in society and AI definitely could be one of them, I'm not sure they happen that quickly. You know, if he said in five years or 10 years time, I'd be backing him, but two years, I mean, that's only sort of like one budgeting process away, you know, a lot of these companies work. And do you think the companies are really going to be ready for their AI future in two years? You know, and every, every worker, I mean, what about what about the person that, as we're talking here, is cleaning the toilets down at the local sporting field or, or the nurse in at RPA hospital? Uh, yeah, I, I see what you mean, Anthony, but, mm. but think of it, uh, he's saying 30% of executive teams. So think of it like this. One of the sessions at the summit was with Matt Common, the chief executive of Commonwealth Bank. He's just come back from two weeks in the US where he clearly learnt a heap about AI. And it was a really fascinating discussion because it was clear that Matt's really trying to get his head around the pace at which everything is changing and the scale of AI and all that sort of stuff. And now Matt's not on his own here. Lots of CEOs are doing this. So I think of it like this. If your CEO is out around the world trying to get their head around this, it comes back to the executive leadership team meeting and says, oh, what do you think about this new AI development? And an executive looks at them blankly and says, what? <laughs> what, what? What are you talking about? Or sort of tries to bluff their way through. I think those executives have probably got a limited shelf life. I think that's what mm. Adam's getting at. That if you can't talk the talk, if you can't lean into this, if you're not thinking about it, you will find it harder to keep your spot in an executive team. That, that's, I think, the point that Adam yep. was trying to get across, that businesses need to change. That, that You can't just sort of look at this stuff and say, oh, You know, the tech guy will sort that out or the IT guys are all over that. I don't need to worry about it. It's a more holistic thing now. It's pervading lots of parts of the business. And it'll be those companies where all the executives sort of show an interest and are learning and are trying to get on top of this. They'll be the ones that do the best job of of implementing it, I reckon. Yeah, I think think you're right by pointing out Matt Common, uh, his panel. I mean, it was unbelievable. I didn't hear him say the word mortgage, capital, regulator, loan, customer, all the things that bank CEOs normally talk about. I mean, he was just like a generalist, James, just like you and I, but maybe harder working and better paid. (laughs) And he was just trying to explain what he learned in the US about AI and particularly about the power of computers, which I think he said were growing at about 10 times a year. I mean, he could have been the CEO of any company up on that stage, just trying to get their head around the changes. But James, what did you make of some of the real life examples of where companies are starting to use AI? Is it happening yet? I think it's starting to happen, but not necessarily with generative AI, which is the chat GPT stuff that we've all got excited about over the last 12 to 18 months. This is more the machine learning AI, the old school AI, I guess, that's starting to, that's mainly being used. It's being used in a couple of areas, I think. Risk management, so the banks are particularly using it to scan for frauds and scams and and problems in their banks like that. We're seeing it used a a little bit in legal areas to digest big documents Mm -hmm. and help summarise that. We're particularly seeing it used in software engineering. We heard uh, David Walker, the CTO, the Chief Technology Officer of Westpac, say that his software engineers are about 25% more productive when they're using a... Uh, AI assistant to help them write code. Yeah, wow. So yeah, it, it's it's starting to happen. I think it's starting to happen in big companies, but the building blocks are there. Still a lot of experimentation going, still a lot of people trying to get their heads around, do we go for the quick wins now or do we need to invest in the way, the foundations in, in a better way? So I think those are some of the questions big companies are, are asking themselves too. But 
The other bit, we've been talking a bit about this on the podcast, Anthony. We had an executive from the data center group Air Trunk, which is sort of up for sale at the moment, mm-hmm. $15 billion valuation. They're seeing extraordinary demand as this AI boom takes off. But there are clear worries about where the energy is going to come from to support new data center development and, and AI uh, rollout. I mean, we've been talking about this for a while, and you did a piece this week where you tried to answer how much will data centers take out of the power grid? Yeah. I mean, uh, the AirTrunk guy, his name is Damien Spillane. He's the chief customer and innovation officer. He, he, yeah, he was great. I mean, he was, he was a bit light on the specifics, but you've got to understand he's, he is quite wrapped up at the moment, given that it is up for yeah. sale, and <laughs> Macquarie's the major investor there, and and uh, you know they have a habit of being very very good at managing the comms around these sorts of things. But in terms of the yeah the data centers and how much power they're using, so Morgan Stanley, the investment bank, their equities analysts had a had a good look at this, and they reckon they account for about five percent of the Australian grid at the moment. So including both the national electricity market, which most of the country's on, and the and the grid over in WA. So 5% of the grid today, they reckon it'll be about 8% by the end of the decade. So, I mean, I saw those numbers, you know, they're quite manageable, right? I mean, it's not like it's, you know, in Ireland, it's 18% of the grid. In Singapore, they've had to slow down data center development at various times in the past five years because because of fears about uh, power shortages. Here, I mean, we're not at those levels yet. But the problem is, though, it's after 2030, where it's really hard to forecast that's where the problem may be. I mean, yeah. that's when the coal-fired power stations in the East Coast, you know, your, your lawn in Victoria, Luoyang A in Victoria, uh, Iraring here in New South Wales, I mean, that's when they're due to close. By the end of this decade, I think uh, data center capacity is supposed to be at about two and a half times what it is today. Right. But it's just the way that it's growing is just sort of exponential. So you do worry about where the power is going to come from after that. But yeah, I mean, at 8, 8% at the end of the decade, for me, that sounded fairly manageable. And when you look at the big, big power users historically, like your aluminium smelters, for example, yep. they tend to take more power out of the network than, than what this whole data center industry may do. Yeah, okay. Maybe, Anthony, uh, as we move into the next decade, those executives who's lost their jobs, we can put them on bicycles and <laughs> get them pedaling to power the uh, second part of the AI revolution. Yeah. I mean, one one thing that I came away with, James, like how quickly is this AI stuff changing? Yeah. It's just moving so fast. I mean, when do you think we should hold the next AI summit? <laughs> I don't know. Six weeks' time? <laughs> um, uh, that's a really good question. It, you, you do get the sense that you could have another one in six months and we'd be talking about a whole different set of things or at least a whole new set of real-world examples. So yeah, it is fascinating how quickly this is um, changing. There's talk of sort of an eight-month development cycle. I mean, annually we'll probably be fine, but, geez. This room was packed to the rafters. I reckon we could have had twice the number of people in there. Mm. Everyone's so hot on it. So it's it's such an area to watch. For our second topic, James, let's go into the world of big property and the company that brought us Barangaroo in Sydney, Docklands in Melbourne and the Brisbane showground in Queensland, and that's Lendlease. Lendlease has set the benchmark for large-scale Australian property developments. It's revered and respected and the sort of company that trained up half of what is now a really large and important industry. Lendlease took its development model offshore decades ago, first to the US in the 1970s and later Asia and Europe. Its offshore arms go through feast and famine, much like the cyclical development market. But for the past decade or so at least, it has really been in famine territory. Now, James, it got to the point, and we've been writing quite a bit about this, where Lendlease was barely making any money, if, if it was making money at all, developing and constructing offshore. And those frustrated shareholders pretty much tore the joint down. Lendlease this week announced a full retreat from offshore development and construction in a huge strategy reset, James. Now, you spoke to Lendlease CEO Tony Lombardo on Monday after he revealed the big changes and basically they're shrinking this company. Was it a happy or sad day, do you think? Oh, I asked him that. Uh, he insisted it was a good day. Mm-hmm. Um, he was putting on a brave face, sort of said he's charged up and excited about the changes. But look, no one likes being bossed around by activist investors, do yeah. they, Anthony? True. No, no, no CEO likes to see their uh, sort of global empire being rolled back. Mm-hmm. 
Um, he's already cut 30% of Len Lisa's staff in the last couple of years. Wow. Uh, under these changes in which, uh, as you said, they'll pull out of developing and constructing offshore, particularly in North America and Europe, there's another 35% of the staff to go. Wow. Wow. Um, so, and I think almost $5 billion worth of assets to be placed on the sale block. So, look, this is a big change to the way Lend Leases operated. Um, you know, it was set up by this guy, Dick Dusseldorp, uh, back in the 50s. You know, 13 years after it started, it was already in North America. So, it's always been this global player, uh, you know, this sort of. Um, disruptor from Australia on the global stage, but it, it's just going to have to give up those dreams, focus back on Australia, and, and start delivering some good returns for its shareholders who are really frustrated, it must be said, although they're pleased to finally see some action on that front. But why, James? Why is Lendlease struggling so much? Why are the shareholders frustrated? Like, what are the forces that are sort of driving this? I reckon there's two big forces. One is interest rates. I mean, we had a period after the GFC where rates were extremely low and capital didn't have a cost on it. And so any of your mistakes never really got punished because you could always just borrow a bit more money and get on with the game. So we saw all sorts of people do really well during that period. Private equity, venture capital, property developers, mm. You know, cheap debt makes just such a difference. But now there's a price on debt. Investors are nervous. Things have slowed down. It's harder to build. It's more expensive to build in many of these places. You know, we're talking about 30%, 40% increases in construction costs. And, you know, it's just a harder market to operate in. Uh, uh, John Wiley, one of the activist investors who's been prodding Len Lease for change. He, he said, you know, the free money heroes are gone now. Mm. The other big force, though, is just how big capital markets have got. So 20 years ago, Len Lease could be this, you know, global Aussie, this, this disruptive force, a big enough to play on the global stage. But now Len Lease is clashing with these private capital giants like Blackstone, which has a trillion US dollars yeah. of assets under management, or Brookfield, or the sovereign wealth funds, who are huge, or even our superannuation funds. And really, when compared to those businesses, Lend Lease looks like a bit of a rounding error. So the idea is pull back to Australia, let your global ambitions go, and and just focus focus on, on, on what you actually do best. And uh, yeah, to, to borrow a line from Trump, uh, Tony Lombardo was, was basically saying, let's, let's make an Australian lend lease great again. But Anthony, <laughs> the irony here is that a smaller lend lease that's focused on Australia might actually be more vulnerable to a takeover. Mm -hmm. Could we see the lend lease name disappear? Does it become a, a, an M&A target? It was funny you mentioned that, James. I, I saw its name on an M&A targets list this week. JP Morgan, one of the other brokers, and their equities team sort of went through and put together a list of their targets because, I mean, the strategist over there, he says, look, conditions are right for an M&A uh, boom, basically. I mean, he yeah. says, look, at whenever the share market goes up strongly, M&A normally goes up strongly too because – M&A is cyclical like the, like the share market. And when people get more confident, they start doing more deals. And one thing that makes directors more confident is a share price going up. So it, it often lays the groundwork for more deals. Now, Lendlease, yeah, was, was one of the names on the list. I don't know. I don't know if you'd be happy or sad if you saw Lendlease. I'd be sad. Lendlease clean itself up like this. And then, yeah. like you say, a Brookfield or a Blackstone or, or one of those guys swoops in and and takes it out. But I mean, the list itself was pretty long. But there were Give other, us some other names. Other people on the list um, and some short sort of reasons why. So Blue Scope, the steel maker, it's got yep. a big Australian business, a big US business. Thesis was maybe someone comes in and breaks up the Australian from the US. Another one was Challenger Limited, the big annuities company. There's a trend globally of asset managers coming in and acquiring these life insurers and roll, sort of rolling them into their investment management book. Clean Away Waste Management was another one. It's got strategic assets, circular economy tailwinds. I've written a little bit about that. Yeah. It was down to EDI, the big contractor, potential breakup play. 
Next DC, the data center owner, which is one of the yep. rare remaining data center developers in listed markets. But I would argue it's been too expensive for too long, and that's why it hasn't been taken out yet. And then you've got energy giants like Origin Energy and AGL Energy, which have both been subject to bids in the past two years. And it's sort of, it would be about taking them out as this whole transition is playing out, the need to reinvest profits into future facing assets. So it was quite a long list, but to go with their list, to add credibility, they pub- they republished the same list they did in 2021. Yes. And, and quite a few of those businesses had been picked up, like Sydney right. Airport, Borrell, Crown Resorts, Cement Maker, Adbri, Perpetual, which just shows you, I mean, picking M&A targets, it's not rocket science. It is, you know, it's, it's all, it's all just about timing, right? And, yeah. and businesses, when they, when a business that has a big position in its market, when it goes through a bit of a cyclical downturn, if you add debt in there, if you add some aggrieved shareholders, if you add desperate management, you pretty quickly get into the situation where it can easily become an M&A target. Yeah, yeah. Just getting back to Lend Lease for a second, Anthony, the next big decision is who becomes the Lend Lease chairman. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the Michael Ulmer, the current chairman, has announced he'll retire by November. Yep. Uh, shareholders want someone from outside the company but with property experience. You, you got a, an early favourite for us? Well, there's that John Molko who used to be uh, chairman of Mervac. I mean, he's the name that's been put out there and I think there's a bit of a push for him. Yeah, I would I would add another name. Peter Allen used to run Center Group. Now Center yep. is owns the Westfields. Uh, it's you know developed a lot of those over the years. Still owns them. Ran it for the Lowies. So this bloke Peter Allen should be good at uh, shareholder relations and uh, yes. and tight spots. Um, what about yourself, James? No, Mulcahy the, is the name that keeps coming up. Former Lend Lease executive. So we'll have a bit of institutional knowledge too from the the sort of good old days, quote unquote, that he can. Uh, bring to bear but that is definitely the next big decision that lend lease shareholders are looking at all right we'll be back after the break anthony and we've got a curly question about why our insurance premiums keep going up so much back in a sec Welcome back. If you want to know more about what we're talking about today and a whole lot more, AFR subscribers can sign up to the Chanticleer newsletter at join.afr.com forward slash Chanticleer. Every Friday, the newsletter pulls together the best Chanticleer columns from the week and the best bits of this podcast and delivers them straight to your inbox. Okay, Anthony, uh, you're up on Summit Deck next week. Yeah. The AFR has its ESG Summit starting Tuesday. This will be interesting. I think we're, we're sort of breaking it into two chunks. One's looking at the industry and, and the second chunk's looking at ESG investors. Yeah, hot time for ESG. I guess it always is. But the, the trick at this summit, I think, is to broaden out what we all think about with ESG. Like it's not just yeah. the E, it's not just the environment. We've got the S and the G as well, James. I mean, that's the social and the governance side of the ESG. Yeah. And if you look at companies that have got in the p- trouble in the past year, you look at PwC, Qantas, Optus, Woolworths. Yep. It's the S and the G that's getting them in trouble. Yeah. Like when, when was the last time a CEO lost their job for de- deferring their net zero targets? I don't, it's not really happening here yet. So very yeah, good point. hopefully we can yeah. keep it nice and broad. Yeah, that's a good idea. Uh, get an important, a really important bit of economic data on Wednesday. It's GDP growth, Anthony. This is a strange one. No one wants to see the economy go backwards, but the RBA probably wouldn't mind if the number was soft, would they? Yeah, and the share market. Yeah. They need a soft number to take some of the heat out of this inflation data. We, we had monthly inflation this week. Things are still hot. Mm. Uh, and core inflation is actually rising, which is not a good sign. Um, Friday night, the big number out of the US is employment, uh, jobs data. So again, <laughs> the market will be hoping for some bad news, which would be good news for stocks because it brings us closer to those rate cuts. So uh, watch out for that. Uh, we love questions here on the Chanticleer podcast. And this week, our question is from Roman Garcia from the central coast of New South Wales. If you've got a question and that you want to send in, you can email us at chanticleer at afr.com. You can also send us a question in audio form. Just record a voice memo on your phone, include your name and where you're from and email it to us. And that's exactly what Roman's done. Hey, Chooks, Roman here. Love the podcast. 
I noticed that in the monthly inflation data this week that insurance prices were the biggest mover, up 16.5% year on year. That feels pretty right to me when I look at my bills, but what on earth is going on here, guys? Yeah, good question, Roman. Uh, <laughs> and I feel your pain. Mm. The, the bills are incredible. I think there's two things going on here, Anthony. Uh, one on car insurance, one on home insurance. So just just to deal with car insurance first, what we've seen on car insurance is a big jump in the cost of repairing a car, yep. uh, whether that's labor, parts, all that sort of stuff. It, it, it has really shot up in the last few years. It's starting to moderate and starting to come down, but there's a lag because, you know, you pay your insurance uh, 12 months in advance. And so there's a lag in the pricing. So yes, that has been high. It will come start to come down. The other thing though is a home insurance and it is being high and I think unfortunately will continue to be high. Um, two things happening here. Yes, construction costs, tradie pricing is is way up. You know, it costs more to get a 20% more to get a tradie in, in Melbourne where I am, Anthony, according to the insurance industry's estimates. So that's one part of it. But the other part of it is these climate risks mm. that we're seeing which mostly hit houses rather than cars, we're seeing less reinsurers. So these are the insurers that sell insurance to insurance companies. You can follow that. The reinsurers are pulling back. They're saying, we are worried about these climate risks, these storms, these floods, these sharp, short events that we see that can be particularly costly. They're not so worried about the big long-term events like earthquakes and volcanoes. Those are still, um, you know operating on similar patterns. But these shorter, sharper, more regular climate events are just a a real worry for the reinsurance sector. So that reinsurance is more expensive and that is being passed through to households. What's unusual, Anthony, is that we're seeing house insurance and car insurance going up at the same time. And that's what really stings, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. You're right, though. It all comes back to those reinsurance markets. So as a as a whippersnapper at PwC, I used to audit audit those reinsurance hey, agreements. You're right. And um, yeah, so what what a lot of people don't understand if you insure your car or your house with NRMA or RACV or RACQ or whoever, yeah, whoever, they don't yep. they don't actually hold that risk. They just sell the risk onto someone else. And there's so there's a there's a quite a small pool of big buyers for that risk. And um, they, they've really tightened the belt. They don't want to buy as much as they used to because of climate change, because of all the, the floods and fires and everything we've been having. So the, the insurers are having to pay more to get that risk off the books, which increases yep. their costs. But I mean, the other thing that um, the insurers don't want us to think about as much, James, but it is relevant at the moment, their profit margins are also up. You yeah, know, so they point. are they are making more money, and if you want proof of that, just look at the share prices of IAG, Suncorp, or QBE Insurance Group, and they've they've had healthiest sort of uh, rallies. So because uh, you know they have benefited from a bit of a benign claims environment um, in the past sort of twelve months or so. Yeah, good point. Good point. All right, Anthony. Uh, thanks for another big week. Um, you'll be looking hard at the GYG prospectus over the weekend with a burrito by your side, no doubt. So uh, lots of coverage to come on that hot topic over the next couple of days. Yeah, I might have to do some taste testing. Love it. Good idea. See you next week. If you like the podcast and you want to hear more, consider sharing or giving the podcast a review as it helps other listeners find us. And don't forget to follow wherever you get your podcasts. At The Financial Review, we investigate the big stories about markets, business and power. For more, go to AFR.com and you can subscribe to The Financial Review, the daily habit of successful people at AFR.com slash subscribe. Chanticleer was hosted by me, James Thompson and Anthony McDonald was produced by Alex Gow and Lap Fan. Our theme is by Alex Gow. The executive producer is Fiona Buffini. The Australian Financial Review.